Welcome back everyone to TNO, the last days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mokalover, as you probably know by now. But we need to read about a call to Parliament for Parliament. And if the Honourable Gentleman would declare that no such forces exist, that no one from outside England's borders seeks to harm us, I would gladly retire to a home in the countryside and call myself satisfied with that England's future is secure. But I believe that there are many powerful nations beyond these isles that seek to control and conquer us, and I must not stand idly by and watch them do it. Perhaps the Honourable Gentleman would prefer to do nothing. Jeers and roars erupted before the Speaker calmed down the place. Macmillan continued, And frankly, there are many malevolent actors within England itself. It is necessary for the security of what we have built to ensure that such actors cannot accomplish their aim of destroying our national unity and forcing a certain ideology. At this, the RP and the NP MPs revolted, standing and yelling at Macmillan, calling him the real dudist, saying that England couldn't survive without them, and calling for his resignation among other extreme measures. However, Macmillan had accomplished what he wanted from his remarks. The idea was now out in the open that certain measures could be taken against the dudes and the hardliners in the NF and the RP. His bench has also remained almost silent. It was almost time to secure his hold. The shadow looms larger, in which yesterday we finished off doing... Or off screen, I finished off look, do, doing look over the floor, and we're currently doing the corrupt, and dudes have to go. United England is now England's only hope for salvation from the forces of dudism and corruption. If either of our opposition parties were ever to gain power, it would be a disaster without comparison, so venal and debased are their flaws. Luckily, the party chairman has a plan he will outline to Prime Minister Maudlin. The corruption and disloyalty of our opposition comes with certain advantages, namely that were invested England to answer public calls for the investigation of corruption within Parliament, we would catch a far greater number of MPs with loyalties to the National Front and Royal Party when then we would our own supporters. We can even investigate and search for evidence ourselves for who knows the secrets of former friends better than Macmillan. So the Royal Party National Front support will all decrease and we get more support, and we'll do the Anti-Corruption Act, because I want to see what happens with this act. Corruption is a disease that affects politicians like lice. A little... A little isn't an issue worth dealing with. A modern mom might require some care to stamp out. When faced with an infestation, only fumigation will solve our problems. <clears throat> the Anti-Corruption Act is a, bit, is a bill drafted by Mr. Macmillan and other concerned MPs of United England to outline some certain clear expectations on what the newly formed England expects of its political classes, with some severe penalties for gross levels of corruption and a dedicated watchdog organization to catch, to, to catch the more unwise MPs in the act. Oh, the Royal Party and the National Front will howl and complain, no doubt, but... It is us, not them, who are in power now. The public will love us even more for this. So, we have a couple comments to go through. Someone recommended we spend more on military services or military spending, and which I did, actually. I've already gone ahead and done that, because it will help us boost more factory output and dockyard output, so I've already gone and done that, which is great. I never realized how long this, this lasts. Like, it's like four months? That's quite a long time. Also, let's see, I've already just gone ahead and done some more, you know, boosting for, you know, the jobs, factories. Can we get another civvy? That should be kind of nice. Now, I've, I've, now, how does the act go when we want to complete it? The anti-bribing act or whatever. Does, is that affected by this? It probably is. Government stability is 44%. We have 167 seats with the United England's Liberals having 50 versus 215 and then 27. So, ooh, that's pretty close. That is pretty darn close. We have 217 seats compared to these guys. That's not good. Hmm. A name lost of history books. Good. All right, and and another comment was that we should focus a little bit more on our anti-tank, as well as get some anti-air, especially when Gor Papa Goring wants to invade us. So we'll probably do that as best we can. Um, it's not looking good. I don't mind cutting down artillery then a little bit. Then, oh, that's not good either. Oof. I'll go down to three, but yeah, there's not really much we can do because we're already building pretty much all the cities up here that we possibly can in England itself and Wales, and we're building a lot. As you can see, a lot of coastal forts. So. Like, we're getting ready for invasion. Invasion time. And I'm going to keep some PP for now, just to see if we need PP to, to pass the act. So, cool. Let's see if we do that as well. And, all right, so we got that one. The backbench liberals. We get more political power, which is nice. We completed this side yesterday. We completed this side yesterday. We'll have to do with Scotland eventually. A land down under. I kind of want to do that. The, our greatest ally. Increase elephant influence by massive amount. Uh, let's do Ma oh, Macmillan O Canada. Relations haven't been good with Canada lately. They refuse to view us as anything other than a, a Nazi puppet state, which, let's be honest, we were. And our bondage prevented us from making any overtures to the Commonwealth, but now we don't have the Huns on our back. So we can take advantage of this new state of affairs to rebuild a relationship with our oldest dominion. We can agree to an exchange of ambassadors and normalization of relations. Granted, our difference in monarchs may be an issue, but we do not seek to make them a colony again, only to have them see us as an equal on the world stage, which is pretty good. 
Oh, look, there we go. So, Anti-Bribery Act. Uh, the Anti-Bribery Act is a piece of legislation focused on preventing and punishing the corruption of government officials of all ranks. Being the first party to really invest in this sort of thing will make the others look somewhat bad in comparison, but the overarching effect of the act will be an increase to national st stability. After all, people do not have to pay bribes or having to pay bribes or people are more inclined to vote for the right way. So, we have a lot of people. We have 218 out of 459 MPs in the House of Com Commons supporting the act, and we need at least 230. So... We'll increase the support for anti-bribery. I will increase their influence. Ooh. Massively increasing their influence. Well, if we get, like, another 12, that's all we need, so. 229. Oh, crap. Do we work with the libs? Oh, no. Eh, I'll work with the libs. We don't work with the royal party. There we go. 236 out of 459. We have two months to do this, which is not bad, so we got it done. Nice. Jobs? Oh, get liberalized economy some more. Ooh, let's go with jobs first, though. Cool. And we have less than a billion here because I did increase military spending, but it's fine, whatever. And then let's go ahead and do the backbench liberals. The liberal faction of the UE has always been the second in charge for a reason, namely that those loyal to Macmillan outnumber them by not an insignificant amount. Yet their ideals of a truly restored democracy and extensive social reform isn't inherently terrible, and their support is useful. It's why we don't treat them like we do the fascists after all. Led by Prime Minister Mr. Moulding, they might not be equal partners in our current alliance of United England, but they are partners nonetheless. And we ought to be careful that we don't alienate them unnecessarily. They are members of the parliament after all, and even after one or two sunken bills could be a detriment to the vision of the party chairman, so we shall let it be, Mr. Lloyd's Canadian Wonderland. Ottawa is a fascinating place, as Foreign Secretary Swellen Lloyd learned as he visited, though not as known as other Canadian cities like Montreal or Toronto. It is still as busy and intricate and made decisions far more important than the other two cities, thus it was quite an eventful and important visit. Canada was considered to be one of the more difficult countries to get along with. It still recognized Elizabeth II as a rightful ruler of Britain, which was a source of frustration between the two nations. Lloyd tried to do his best to look past that when he visited. Restarting this debate would only destroy his visit before it even began. There were far more important things that had to be done in this visit. Besides, it's not like England had any interest in forcing the Canadians to change monarchs anyway. Lloyd tried to keep the conversation on mutually agreeable topics. The desire to keep the Germans out of North the North Atlantic, for starters. Free trade was good too. Everyone liked free trade. And cultural exchanges, those were good. Canada was still a former British colony, and everyone was still inter interested in what the Holman was doing. When he left, he thought he made good progress, not enough to completely bury the hatchet and everything, but enough to make Canada see England in a new light. And a new light m just might be enough to get Canada and England to finally enjoy friendship after so long without it. Another country persuaded. Nice. Um, I'm not really sure which way I want to rush. I really want to do this one, especially before we have elections, but... Mm, the aftermath of the debate, the clean royal party. Yeah, I mean this will, this stuff will also help us as well. So, talk with Maudling. Original Maudling's heart is in the right place. The restoration of democracy, of English liberties and responsibility, respons or responsible, or responsive government. But he misses the forest for the trees. With the dogs bang across the channel and disorderly elements still threat at home, we have to make sure that England is safe for democracy before all else. We need to convince Maudling to see things our way. Yes, he must. Of course, let's keep let's keep spending money because we like spending, spending, spending. Because get more PP that way, and it hurts our deficit. But whatever, our deficit's looking pretty darn good, anyways. The Caucasian anarchy. Oh, nice. And we still have two thirty six, so not too bad. All right, let's go ahead and do this one. Or no, meet with industrial giants. So now we get a whole. I think it was military factory, maybe. I can't remember. It doesn't really matter as long as we do it and get it done. And let's go do that one for more jobs, and then we'll get another city, which would be good. And I'm sorry to those who wanted me to uh, democratize more. It's just I will democratize extreme amounts when I play as a modeling eventually. So I promise that. So promise some acts and win them over. You catch more flies with honey than vinegar. How that old saying relates to our current situation is that we really do need to make some surface level appeals to the more liberal members of the United England to keep them on the same train of thought. We'll throw them a few bones to keep them happy as it were. The easiest way to keep them happy would be introduce some more liberal acts into our legislative agenda, all the usual hot air about the inherent rights of the people and free expression and whatnot. Perhaps even some pardons for a few political prisoners thrown in. Or thrown in with it. We should probably take care of to ensure that we don't release any fascists, though. Uh, if you like to about Red Twilight, please go ahead. This happens every campaign in 1968, but in the act passes. An elderly man sat on a bench reading the local newspaper. The front page reads of the affairs in Westminster. Around in the streets were slightly livelier. The skies were above slightly clearer. News had spread that a new act of parliament had passed through the House of Commons and became part of the Law of the Lamb. News anchors on live TV discussed the ramifications of this recent development. Politicians declared this day as a major success for the party and the country of England. The futures of millions of men and women will be affected by this law even if they never heard of it. Only time will tell whether that's for the better or for the worse. 
English history is written. We get more stability, and support for our enemies goes down, which is pretty good to do. Nice. A stubborn second in command. I'm sorry, Chairman. Could you perhaps repeat the question? Said Reginald Maudling, response of her habitable expression of smug delight upon his face. The boorish politician sat informally across a desk from Macmillan, seemingly having the time of his life. Macmillan gritted his teeth in frustration, rapidly tapping his knuckles on the desk as he considered whether or not to continue the charade of a meeting. Unfortunately, he was dutiful enough to know that his pride was of no substance next to national unity and stability. I had asked you, Reggie, what we need to do to have the liberal faction back my government. Oh, I see, said uh, Maudling. His nose lifted so high that it seemed as though he was mid-sneeze when he spoke. He leaned forward in his chair, as though finally taking the chairman seriously. Well, perhaps you should, could start by no longer flagrantly spitting on democracy and suppressing your political rivals if it's no trouble. But that, too's, that is too burdensome. Perhaps you could send flowers? Ma Macmillan let a long breath, trying to stop the rising anger from boiling over. <laughs> it's temporary, Reggie. You know that already. This is bigger than democratic norms. We're up against fascists and incompetence. Too much is at stake. Well, if you're not going to compromise with them, they'll never compromise with you. You'll never earn their trust if you dance around London playing dictator. But perhaps there are other ways to earn the trust of the liberals. Hey, I can see why they don't trust us. <laughs> so it is what it is. And let's go and do a liberalized economy. Which we're liberalizing. Don't get me wrong. We're liberalizing now. So, yeah. And we're almost done. Now we're done with the land auction. Great. And the Better Education Act. One thing that both Macmillanists and liberal factions of the UE most assuredly agree on is that the state of our education system is simply abysmal. The Royal Party was the party of the elite, having neglected the common people so thoroughly that they even defended countless public schools, truly. The fact that this is even an issue highlights the pitiful nature of our current situation. The Better Education Act is a bill which will attempt to reform the education system into something responsible to the wants and needs of students rather than fruitlessly clinging to outdated and effective methods. With this, we can guarantee the best for our future scholars and learners. We'll also be able to shore up rural support by directing funds to them in particular. Very good. So I'll save her pee-pee because we're going to have to get some pee-pee for that. But then, a calm day in Parliament. The situation is rather decent at the moment. Yes, the foreign policy matter is a bit tense and the royal party is simmering, yet within the party things are about as harmonious as they've ever been. The party chairman and the prime minister have even managed to get out of the legislative agenda ahead of time, to the surprise of all who know the two men. Perhaps they sorted out their differences. Oh, if you are, well, unification 1.166.desk, they're stuck with us now? Nice. Well, regarding of, regardless of what's happening, it's quite refreshing to know that political differences aside, UE is beginning to coalesce into a party worth the label. Perhaps this new unity can be showcased in the speech PM Maudling is said to be preparing. It will certainly be an interesting listen, at the very least. Oh, and we have a little bit of lag in the game, looks like, maybe? Oh, oh, I hope, yep. It should still be going, okay. Ah! Cool. So, uh, I apologize if you can't really hear it. Yeah, it just... The low of audio, so it doesn't overpower my voice, always has to be kept relatively low. So, I do apologize for when we can't do that. But, apparently, we were at 235 supporters for the Education Act, so we're feeling pretty good about that. So, we don't need to actually PP them. Alright, let's go ahead and reduce unemployment some more. And a calm down parliament, the aftermath of the debate. Oh boy. Apparently you can never hammer the message home hard enough that when it comes to the liberal faction of the UE. We protected them from the royal party persecution. We aided them when they needed it. And we even gave them the post of prime minister. Well, they evidently believe they deserve more. Oh, they'll get exactly what they deserve. Macmillan is distinctly unamused to hear some of these tales. More accurately, he has been put in a state of apoc apocalyptic rage over some of these tales, but that is hardly expected given the magnitude of this betrayal. Ev evidently, it is not the job of the liberals to save England from Germany, evidently. It is not their business to be in politics at all. When you want to do something right, you darn well have to do it yourself. The die is cast. Macmillan may have had his disagreements with modeling of late, but he didn't trouble his protege. He didn't doubt him. The man was a good public face, a bill dog to be directed at political problems. The chairman sat back in his parliamentary bench and relaxed to enjoy the show. He prepared this particular occasion himself. Macmillan's pet was to work his usual magic, tearing into the royal party in a debate. The more conservative portion of the UE party were particularly eager to partake in the spectacle of all of it. If I might direct the honorable gentleman of parliament for a moment to the scourge of our homeland, those who spit upon the realities of good governance began modeling over the jeers from the royalist politicians, those arrogant, unrepentant enemies of the state, those who happily intend to kill on barrier democratic traditions to get what they want. 
It was a lull before Maudling continued. For a moment, an internal moment. Maudling stared regretfully into Macmillan's eyes. With every fiber of his being, Macmillan tried to convey a pleading message through their locked gaze, a message for Maudling to not do to not to do what the chairman suspected was to come. Maudling's head shook just the bare smell. Friends, he said, still glaring at the chairman, I speak of no one else but the chairman Macmillan and his party, whose anachronistic governmental scheming threatens the very existence of British democracy. A conservative bench roared to life in protest, but the chairman stayed in his seat, too stunned and hurt to stand up, so be it Maudling has chosen his side. Well, at least he chose his side. Yeah. Alright, so now we get another three more factories. Nice. Not bad still. That's looking good. And we're building up a lot of these places. Oh, ah, uh, civvies. Thank you. Aftermath of debate. That's not very good. Modeling will attack us for the last time. Ooh. Sway the easily persuadable. Sure. Um, the liberals are still part of the UE, nominally. But the recent events have left some easily distinguishable marks between these those loyal to the prime... The, party chairman, and those loyal to the prime minister. Macmillan is still quite incensed at the betrayal of modeling, but he must be admitted this was hardly unforeseen. A shame he might have been quite useful if he hadn't acted so rashly. Let's go on the offense of them. We've identified a number of troublemakers that we can easily expel from the party, or at the very least impress upon them the seriousness of remaining loyal to the PM over the nation. Membership roles will be purged, the key supporters of the prime minister censured, and funding for the more liberal members of the UE stopped altogether. That's only the tip of the iceberg where it's just getting started. Which, actually, you know what, let's wait to do that. Since apparently we have the election season, so let's focus on this stuff more then. Whether we wanted it or not. <clears throat> the royal divorce has forced us to pick sides in the upcoming election, no matter what Prime Minister Holm may have planned. Holm. We must plan it, make a decision. Shall we campaigning with Macmillan to bring forward the change our country so desperately needs, or shall we work with Thatcher that our country may stabilize and start to rebuild? Vote for you, England? Royalists. We want the royalists to win, right? Totally. Uh, instead, we'll probably end up doing this stuff, but let's see what we have for decisions here. And we... Alright, so election season looking not too bad. We are the United England. We have a good amount of support here. Um, over here we have a very good amount of support. Uh, 47 is pretty good. East Midlands looking very good as well. Newcastle is looking very, very good. Cornwall is looking not great. The NF is pretty popular there too. And 47% versus... 37% versus... Uh, we could probably get Yorkshire very quickly. That's really bad for Lancashire. If that's how you pronounce it, as well as Wiltshire, Wiltshire, um, RP. Uh, well, this one's pretty close. Yorkshire. Cool. So we gotta keep that tab open. Um, reduce unemployment. Oh, liberalized economy. Yeah, we do that one. Now this more cities are great. And then we will have. Let's work with uh, a cultural exchange with Canada. Nice. Canada and the UK have long shared similar cultures to each other, as well as a fascination for the other's way of life. The war and the occupation has temporarily stopped this cultural two-way, and we've gone off in a direction different than Canada has. Why not find out what the other's doing at the moment? We must introduce the English culture to Canada. Their cities will host exhibitions by modern English artists. The universities and libraries will be visited by English writers, and English musicians will tour the provinces, and will gladly allow them to do the same. We'll show them that England is not in the cultural blood of fetishistic. Aryan depictions, like the rest of Northern Europe, and they will show us that Canada's culture was not purchased by American movie and record studios. Why not? That sounds great. Right. Oh, did he slip? Let's go there next. Oh, wait. oh, we don't even have to hover. We can just... Well, that's a lot of seats. We just have to look at this stuff, so... A moment of reluctance, but not hesitation. The honey-toned whiskey tasted of nothing but burned Harold Macmillan's throat terribly as he brought it from the desk to his mouth time and again, like unwanted clockwork. So it made no meaning any longer, having long since lost its use as a framework of reference when measuring the ocean despair crashing upon the chairman's overburdened shoulders. Another the glass empty, another cigar burned down to the knob. Betrayed, modeling a betrayed, and Macmillan could get over that despite the sting of it upon his mind. But the effects of betrayal shattered Macmillan's soul. It led to an inevitable and nauseating conclusion. The liberals would stand with modeling. They would position themselves in alignment with its adversaries. He sputtered and coughed into another glass as the wretched liquid failed to quell the conclusions he knew he would have to face. How could this have happened? How could the world be so unceasingly callous as to a place to call him in this position? He didn't hate the libs. Not one, not even one bit. Not one bit at all. They were the last two hours that he and his loyals had against the malignant factions that had spawned in the nation. Macmillan didn't want to fight them. He wanted to protect them. He would have had <clears throat> their shield against the hate of the black shirts, against the decadence of the royalists. But now, thanks to modeling, they would turn against them. And so, too, they would need to be dealt with in the same way. Old friends make for the bitterest of foes. Oh, boy. Victor's Vigilant. This looks like... A thing from, like, Metal Gear Solid Five, the thing that you, like, put packages onto? I don't know. I don't know why I thought of that immediately, but it is what it is. Cool. And keep campaigning. Keep campaigning. Keep boosting it up. 
and cutting it down. Nice. Ah, uh, we're looking pretty good. Pretty good so far. So we're at 50 percent. We are at 46, 46, 46. Uh, That's pretty. That's pretty close right here. Uh, anywhere else, it's pretty close. Ooh, that's not bad. Oh, let's do Cornwall because that looks pretty bad right there. All right, and a cultural exchange, and then we'll do help. Help me help you. I have an excuse of wheat. Ship it over here. Loggers out of work. We'll buy it from you. Want some workers to help you with your factories? Why not build it here? Now you need help with your chemical plant? We have a few things IG Fiber left behind in the war that might help you. By helping Canada with a variety of problems, we can help them overcome the various challenges that they may face. And once they realize they need England, they will be sure to extend their thanks through improved diplomatic relations. If, uh, this is exactly the same thing, so academic base will improve, and every own state, Macmillanus, support will increase. Nice. Alright, that's not too bad. That's looking better now. Um, let's see... No, no, we're looking pretty good pretty much everywhere. Except for these two areas, but that's fine. Let's do that one, why not? And let's see, what can we do about this stuff? Reduce unemployment? Sounds good to me. Oh, we have more down here too. Oh, there's a lot down here. Help me, help you. Nice, okay, so 39, 53. Oh, we can probably do this area and do it really quick. London is very bad for us. Wow, that's pretty bad. They have a lot of seats. Eh, it's actually not that many seats. Not as much as I thought it would be. Uh, let's do the land down under. Australia and New Zealand have been about as far from our minds since the war as they are from London. They have in the meantime cut off many of their ties with the former British Empire and are mostly concerned with fending off any Japanese encroachments. The situation does not involve us in any way, but we will be sure to improve relations with them regardless. As clearly they want a reset relationship and we will give them what they want. <clears throat> they will see you to see us or see them as equal. They want us to see them as equals, and we expect them to treat us as a legitimate government of England. Once this is out of the way, we can get along just fine. Uh, we'll, we'll do this one first, and then we'll do Australia, okay? We'll do, then we'll do Australia, just because, uh, because, because we can. Just because that'll decrease your support, and let's go ahead and come to Severn. Uh, we're looking pretty good all over the place, so... Um, there we go. Actually, how much support do we have down here? That's only three parliamentary states, so it's not even worth it. Yeah, it's not really worth doing that one too much, so. Anything else? No? Okay. The final test. Scotland. Oh, no. Scotland ran away from England, not because of any mistreatment, but because they didn't want to be another puppet of Germany. And who can blame them? Being a puppet of Germany was no fun for us either. This had led to a huge rift between our two nations. One which left the border heavily armed in the Sc Scottish paranoid. We may not have had the best recent history together. Scotland was funded and armed the rebels not so long ago. But that can be forgiven as them trying to find a way out of a tough situation. And they haven't been the most eager to cooperate since we won because we're directly descended from that regime. But we are a new nation. One that does not tolerate fascism in the slightest. We want to respect each of our citizens and protect their liberties and freedoms. The Scottish shall be made to understand this, and they must know that a permanent alliance is the most beneficial to our collective security. If they join, it will be proof that everything we work for has become a success. If not, we will make, we will be made to take decisive action in a chemical corporation's Vancouver's headquarters. <clears throat> and we'd like to get production lines up as soon as we can, said Rory Parker, president of a Canadian chemical company. We have a competing company that is going to put their own drain cleaner into the market, and we want to compete with them. Can you handle that? Uh, certainly said English chemical engineer Casey Bailey. We've already built the plant near Liverpool. Once we have an idea of how hot you want to run the process, we'll be coming out of the batch that you'll... What is that? Parker realized Bailey was talking about the machine in the office. That's a computer, he said. We use it to do useful things like calculate the company's payroll. Much easier and more efficient than having 12 people do it. Do you have anything like that in England? Bailey shook his head. No, there isn't technology available for that in England. They don't allow puppets of the right to have fancy equipment like that. He paused and thought for a moment. Where can I get one? I'll give you the address, Parker said. They'll send you a catalog with some useful information. Now, back to the drain cleaner plant. Canadians are so friendly. We love the Canadians. No one can hate Canadians unless you really want to hate them. Hey, look, our G actually, our GDP is very similar to our debt. By suppressing our debt increases, or deficits, we've done really totally okay, but we reunite with survivors. When the Huns crossed the channel and set further paws upon our fair land, the British army resisted them on every step of the way. They fought on the beaches, on the landing grounds, in the fields, in the streets, they fought in the hills, and they, even though they were pushed out of England, they never gave the line in the north, in Scotland, and they never were ever, ever surrendered. Never, ever surrendered. Now, as the German yoke no longer rests on the English neck, we shall welcome them back, one and all. Hopefully they want to come with us back home. And we're done with our land auction, just in time to beat the crap out of the Scottish. Sorry, Dunes ancestors, but it is what it is, and no, nothing for us in Nice. We can probably still get this one. This is a, that's 93 seats. That's quite a few. 
Anything up here? Nope. A quiet unification. Well, I guess we just have to wait. Let's wait and see what their response is. Our GDP is actually bigger than our debt. Nice. Ah, the dam is done. Good. That's for Jonas. Yes, please. And we get another milli. Nice. Keep keep making those stuff. And then we're actually doing very well right there. So actually, we're looking relatively okay. We're looking relatively okay, actually, which is nice. 51 to 40 percent. Um, that didn't really do much. It did it. Uh, seven is just not. Doesn't have that many seats. The one we're doing right now up here has 93, so it might be worth doing that a little bit more. And the conference begins. A group of diplomats walk onto the plane at Heathrow. It leaves the ground early in the morning, and in an hour or so will be in Edinburgh. When it lands, the negotiations will begin. Negotiations that will determine the fate of the British eye on the people on it. Negotiations that, if successful, will unify Scotland with England once again. Negotiations that may finally allow us to take the mantle of the United Kingdom of old. These will be hard. The Scots will certainly drive the hardest bargain they can, but they will not surrender their freedom or nothing in return. And failure on our part will certainly lead to another massive war on the island, one which will not exact a large cost in the lives on both sides. Let's see what I'm talking. So apparently someone said in the comments yesterday too that if the All-Stars would have won, we could have annexed them too. Which is actually really, really cool, but uh, I would actually like to see that. Removing the old guard. Liberalize. Uh, let's get that one. The talks begin. In Edinburgh, <clears throat> a room is full of people. One side sits a group of English diplomats, on the other, officials of the Scottish government. They look at each other, sizing each other up. They have thing they have to. Things are just too important to not pay attention. The negotiations for the future of Scotland have begun. Will Scotland enter England as an equal partner? Will the original arrangement with Scotland and the Act of the Union be maintained? Or will something in between be agreed to? It remains to be seen, but one thing is for certain, if the negotiations fail here, a war will surely break out between the two nations. Let's do this. Okay, this is barely going down for the uh, Royal Party, but whatever. Liberal victory in Canada? Okay. Liberalism, the philosophy of our time? Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. We're incredibly stable, but our opening offer. Let's start with an opening proposal. Now, the ideal situation is we end up where Scotland was under the Act of Union. Obviously, that would be more than acceptable to us, and it's something reasonable we can ask for. We couldn't give the Scots a worse deal than they once had. They would reject it outright anyway. Of course, they probably won't like this one either. They will, in all likelihood, ask for something a bit better on their end. We should be prepared to receive this notice and think about our next steps, but you aren't just going to annex an independent nation without giving them some autonomy in return. This isn't the 30s. You have to start with something. Oh, we're getting closer. Everything up here north is looking pretty darn good. And... I like how we can campaign really quickly, but... I guess so... Oh, the net NF really can't do that too quickly. Oh, we can get these guys. We can probably get these guys. West Midlands. Uh, where is it? Midlands? West Midlands? Oh, they're, oh, they're coming up again. Wait. U.S. forces is not... What? Why did you cancel your non-aggression pact? What? Counter-offer. Do you mean to insult me? Asked a Scottish negotiator. Nobody's going to agree to become a puppet of London up here. Not after we've had more freedom for so long. We want more than just status quo. Far more. We'll keep up our own parliament. We'll honor our own elections. English laws will stop at the border as well. We'll take care of our own business. Taxation will be left up to us. And massive protections for language must be left in as well. You want a union, then it's going to have to be a union of equals. How about a Scottish council instead? That's fine. Ah, uh, let's play hardball. Because we can just take them out, probably, so. Uh, we can have some limited autonomy. We'll place a little... We'll negotiate. Send in the negotiators. Especially with these American divisions. They should do relatively well against enemies, so there you go. Nice. Oh... Hmm, we can do that just in case, because getting these will not pretty much do anything for us. Well, we don't have that long to do it. Add four popularity. And Scotland says what? Actually, these guys have 49 seats, even though we got this one that's 93 seats. Wow. Mm hmm. Oh, it's looking not too bad now. Anything up north? Nope. Uh, 43... Seven? I don't know. It's only three. It doesn't matter. One last try. We want a Scottish Council full stop. Either we receive the Council or Scotland will not join the Union. Simple as that. If we join the Union, we only want a Council for us to self-govern, said the Scottish negotiator to an English negotiator who had sat across from him at the table. The English negotiator seemed even more annoyed and replied. More annoyed than anything that at the fact that he now had to deal with the idea of a Scottish Council running around. If they let the Scottish join and stand down, it could be a massive blow for the country. Letting a country in with such high autonomy... This could be a disaster for the public, however. The idea of a Scottish council could lessen tensions between the two countries. He replied then to the Scot, hoping he could persuade the man. Read client, final warning. Um, that's not spell blood. Let's try not. We'll accept your proposal. We'll try that. We'll see what happens. And let's liberalize. I kind of do want to wonder what they're going to say. Uh... 
and come on and with elections are almost done we should get our campaign done first though before that happens so we should probably we should probably be able to win pretty easily but equal exchange two things are happening today both in edinburgh and both at the same time at the redford cavalry and infantry barracks a group of 51st highlanders stand outside looking at a flagpole a group of press and onlookers are standing outside the Scottish government building as well, looking at two flagpoles instead. One has nothing flying, while the other one to the left has St. Andrew's Cross. One army band plays a Scottish national anthem. The Scottish flag at Redford is taken down. The soldiers look on in silence. Some cries, others keep a stern face throughout. Then the band strikes a new tune, and another flag is raised up the pole. At the same time, the song, same song is played in front of the Scottish government building, and the same flag is being hoisted. The emotions are a lot less subdued here. Some cry while others cheer. It is a sad event, but there is a silver lining to it. The song is the English national anthem. The flag is the one of United Isle. At the end of the song, the flag is flung all the way up. England is gaining control over the Scottish military, and Scotland has its own council. Jolly good. We get Scottish council. Oh, that really hurts us. I should not have gone for that. Oh, I really should not have gone for that. Minus 30% political power. The Royal Party of support will decrease. We get Scottish riots. Uh, we annex them. At least we get cores. We get Scottish riots for a while. Well, at least we get them. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah, this council, mm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if I really feel that now. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. Wow! Okay, now we have 69 billion GDP. Oh, wait, I actually had a big deficit because of our military. Um, actually, hold on. So, they went to war with Bulgaria. And I said this was on the last episode. This happens often. Oh, Goring's not, to, not going to attack now. Okay. Just because, I, I don't know, that just doesn't seem right. How can they go to war with Bulgaria if Romania is not in their faction? Look at that. Oh, my God. That's, they're in the Japanese faction. I forgot. Oh, my... Even Romanian... Oh my gosh, that's nuts. So, okay, so Goring is not going to, going to attack, which is good, but a quiet unification. If you liked about or, or a lot of refusal, please go ahead. Actually, that's not bad. More division attack. We should have gone with that one. But the situation has developed just as we had hoped. The Scottish government has accepted our offer. There will be no more bloodshed, no more pain. Our heroes are coming back home and all with all of it. Scotland with them. Yeah, that was not a great thing to do. Yeah, Scottish councils... Freedom for them! Oh, man, freedom. All right, so since they're not going to attack, I don't think we really need all these divisions then. So, there you go. I still like these guys. You guys can... Ooh, what are you? 14 combat with is not too bad. I prefer the American ones. I forget which one is larger. American volunteers? There you go. Uh, you can join them there. Other than that, these guys are all okay. Oh, we can't disable some of these guys. <laughs> yeah, the uh, Scottish military joined us, so we got rid of them. <laughs> oh, man. If that's the case, you guys can just go right there. That's fine. Minus one and a half billion, not bad. The Reformation of the UK. Just in direction. No. Wow, and it looks like uh, the Royal Party got quite a bit of Northern England. Or Northern Scotland, I should say. Not England. Same thing, basically, right? But the choice of direction. Nobody could have said both campaigns hadn't tried their hardest. Every possible deal they could well, make was made. All the support they could purchase had been obtained, and every path they could take has been taken of. Now, those of the night it all paid off. Elections have been typically private. Acquired affairs in, in England <laughs> where the outcome had never been in doubt. But this time, things were different. The victor was not known by the electorate or the MPs themselves, and all they could do was sit down and watch the ballots come in, and see who got the support from whom. There were surprises and betrayals, along with expected trends and low support. But as the night went on, it added up in one direction. And England knew who knew who would win this contested election and have massive influence over the nation. United England wins the elections. And look at our flag. Beautiful, my friends. Absolutely beautiful. Together at last. As Edinburgh passes from the control of separatists and nationalists into our own hands, uh, the... The UK, considered by many to be dead and forever lost to the annals of history, rises anew. Peace returns to the long-suffering island, one built to last. We have proven to all that Britain, however beaten and battered, has still has enough to strength, has still has enough strength to stand on its own. Nice. But we don't have a. Yeah, we need Ulster. We could have, should have gotten Ulster, but that's all right, because that's not quite complete yet. But the UK or the new United England Party has been emerged victorious in the parliamentary elections. Their democratization, sure, and further promise of reform have appealed to many voters in key constituencies and have allowed them to pick up a solid slice of Parliament. While they have declared their intent to work in a coalition government, it is unsure how much they need the Royal Party or the National Front to be able to continue towards their objectives of a democratic England. It certainly remains to be seen whether or not England can stand on its own in the current geopolitical environment as tensions heat up across the globe. One can only hope that the life of a democracy stays as such, at least for the time being. And a new do have a cup of coffee here. 
as well to keep us nice and warm, even though it's probably kind of lukewarm at this point. But look at him. Seems kind of portly near the stomach, but whatever. The puppet master pulls and England dances to the whim, breaking them down. Ah, <laughs> breaking down the Scottish. Who, who doesn't love it? National socialists and other traitorous elements of Scottish society seem to resist their benevolent rule. They attack our soldiers, loot the cities, and terrify our citizens. Their terrorist actions endanger the king's peace and cannot be tolerated. At least we don't have to deal with sea lions, so. I don't mind cutting down maybe the military budget more, because I don't think we'll have any more military conflicts for the rest of this campaign. But it could be very, very wrong. Let's get this next focus done. And then, let's, uh, actually, let's come over here. Uh, that's not too bad. I love that GDP now. Navy. Because we did get the the, the, blah, 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 the Scottish Navy. Combined all into here. That'll be good. And go right there. Train as well, because he can. Actually, what do we have here for this group? Van. Um, we have five carriers and a heavy cruiser and quite a few screens. That's actually kind of nice. Cool. Infantry equipment. Very, very good. Budget. Looking minus 1.18. Not bad. And after that, we will go ahead and uh, break down modeling and his little cronies. As well as we do the land down under. But at least we did it peacefully. I don't think I've ever done it peacefully. I usually just take them out normally. So it's always good to do things maybe a little bit different from time to time. But it's 68, which is not bad. Um, special forces. We don't really have special forces. Let's do some more tank stuff. Because. We love tanks here. I love tanks. Tanks go boom, 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 boom. Sometimes we really need to increase the GDP growth. And actually, since we got Scotland, we can improve them. We can invest in Scotland. Invest in Scotland for Scotland might try to invest in itself, but it could definitely use our help and then give them some roads too. After we build a lot of coastal forts. Actually, uh, I mean, that's still a goal we could still per pursue once we're done here anyway, so. Cool. Land forts, coastal forts. You never know. You never know what might happen, so. Nice. Modeling will attack us for the last time, pretty much. Cool. Edinburgh. Protect all the coasts as much as possible. And even up there, too. Lerwick. And Ramsey. Very good. And next, we'll do this one as well. Land down under, so. Yes. I think I already read this one, so. Yes. That'll be good. Oh, and we have a lot of PP. We're not passing any sort of act either, which is kind of sucky, but whatever. Let's go ahead and meet with industrial giants and then liberalize at the same time. Not bad. Oh, uh, maybe we want to build up the cities first so we can reap the benefits of better GDP. So, and land on under, and then uh, uh, sway the easily persuade. Eh, all this stuff doesn't really mean too much at this point now, since we just won the elections. And I think, do we want to cut down the budget? You know what? Instead of cutting down the budget, we'll just keep it where it is at for now. We're not going to increase the spending for now, so we'll just keep it where it's at. But a, a simple game of cricket once we get flamethrowers done. 68, let's grab some more flamethrowers. I love flamethrowers. England and Australia need to begin to rebuild the relationship. One that's more equal and respectful. Isn't that what sports, where, respects, where respect is earned? For a long time, the Ashes were a series of test cricket matches held between Australia and England. Restoring the series will give both England and Australia something to watch and may improve our respective attitudes towards each other. TV will make these matches more popular than ever before and we can pitch our country in between the breaks. Mr. Lloyd's Outback Adventure. On the surface, Australia seemed like a lost cause for England. How do you work with a country that has been threatened by the same side you have supposedly been with? What common cause do you make with a nation in an entirely different corner of the world? And how do you become friends with a nation that wants nothing to do with the British Empire? That's a very good amount of questions to ask. To Foreign Secretary Selwyn Lloyd, the outright rejection of any governmental links with England was not a stumbling block, but an opportunity for a fresh start. Unlike the Canadians, who still supported the other claimant to the British throne, Australia had no embedded issues that prevented it from seeing the English government as legitimate. England also had no desire whatsoever to return Australia to Dominion status, so that helped talks immensely. As for common cause, it was incredibly simple. We support the Australians against Japanese aggression, and they see more nicely. It wasn't much, but everyone, but telling Australia they were on the right side helped things out. And everyone likes to make money, don't they? Lloyd tried to hammer out home the idea that England and Australia could be trade partners, giving Australia a market for its goods, which is incredibly important. Finally, a bit of sympathy goes a long way. Delivering a wreath to the tomb of the unknown Australian soldier would show sincerity. England hadn't forgotten the Anzacs, and would be that would be conveyed to Australia by that action. Remembering what Australia had done for the British Empire would also acknowledge the reasons for it, declaring itself a republic. At the end of the day, the biggest issues between England and Australia would be bridged by understanding. Now, where can we order a meat pie? That sounds kind of, kind of disgusting. A meat pie. 
Cool. And restoring old trade ties. England has vast industrial potential and a highly skilled workforce. Oceania has wool, mutton, and an amazing amount of raw materials. Or minerals. It makes sense that we start trading once again. They send us the raw materials we need. And the ships bring back the finished products they love. Everyone makes money off of this. And both our economies will boon with this trade going on. What, what's not to love? And everyone wants a friendly match. The two teams walked out onto the pitch. The Australians eager to get going. And the English finally glad they have some competition not from within the Isles. The stands of the pitch were filled to the brim with spectators awaiting the first international cricket game held in the country for a generation. At last, after a brief spot of inclement, inclement weather, the ball was thrown in the spirit of friendly competition was let loose. <clears throat> for several hours, the game was played, uh, before finally England emerged a victor by a small handful of wickets. Commentators noted that the Australians played well, and the Prime Minister congratulated both teams following the match. For a brief moment, it seemed that the days of English glory were back. Old hobbies ought not to die. And our greatest ally. Throughout our history, we see many alliances of convenience take shape and dissolve through countless wars. One day, we align with the Spanish or against the French, and the next, we align with the French against the Spanish. Diplomacy is complicated and oftentimes confusing, but in our most recent history, when we were at our darkest moments, one country could be expected to come in and give all their give give their all against the enemies of freedom. And we must contact the U.S. to restore our grand alliance once more. Absolutely. And we're almost done with restoring our trade ties. England's economic proposal. Australia agrees. Prime Minister, the Australians like the proposal. They'll cooperate with us economically. We need your signature on the deal, and then we can inform the world that we're working together. The ships will start leaving momentarily. Jolly good. 1.1 jumps up to 2.1. What's not to love? Reduce unemployment. And we stopped, demobil uh, stopped yeah, basically demobilizing our manpower because we didn't increase this anymore. So we're going to keep it where it is, like I said earlier. But then, the propaganda giant. America is a country with massive problems. Shh. Under the surface, one will find a massive gap between the rich and poor, rampant discrimination and racial violence, and a nation in permanent fear of being unable to defend itself from the Nazis or Japanese. Yet, you ask anyone outside the U.S. what America is, and they'll tell you it's a nation of tremendous opportunity, a melting pot of the cultures of the world, and a great protector of freedom. This is because, for all the problems it has, America is, tr is tremendously good at selling itself on its goods aspects. We must set up some consultations with Madison Avenue, Hollywood, and the State Department. If they can convince the world and their own people people that America is so perfect and strong, perhaps they can apply their skills to England as well. With some makeup and good lighting, we can make England's problems disappear as well. A plane lands in Dulles. With the sun breaking over the eastern horizon, a jet lands on a runway in northern Virginia. Probably kind of swampy there. It's an English aircraft and comes from Heathrow in London. Or from London. It pulls up to the terminal and offloads an extremely important cargo. A wide variety of people come out. Executive, politicians, trade representatives, diplomats, all representing England and here on a mission of goodwill. The diplomats get into their taxis and rental cars and disperse amongst the city of Washington. Every one of them has a certain destination in mind. Some <clears throat> will go to the HQ of various industry of various industry groups and corporate headquarters. Others will rope shoulders at the State Department or the halls of Congress. One or two will even make it inside the White House. <clears throat> the goal is simple. Relations between England and the U.S. are not as good as they should be, according to the English government. The old way would merely convince the president that England could be useful as a friend and not an enemy, but that's not enough. A government is a complex mechanism, and policy is not just determined by the one at the top. Usually. Washingtonians of all positions will be courted. They will begin to associate England with all sorts of positive things. A profitable trading partner, a historical friend, a potential ally in various foreign policy goals. When that jet leaves for Heathrow, those feelings will be embedded in the minds of all the policymakers of Washington, and they are good at their jobs. Jolly good. I just want to cut down the GDP debt. Or GDP, cut, increase the GDP, lower the debt. The closest cooperation. We're all friends of liberty. We stand against fascism in all forms, and we'll do our utmost to protect the world from it. We'll not forget our international commitments either. And with that, we shall cooperate with the organization of free nations. Our forces are ready to help the OFM where it needs it. Our diplomats will stand by the OFM when they need, they must put pressure on other countries. And the OFM can be sure that one country in Europe will stand by it in all things. Without budging or civilian budget boosts, we get quite a bit more, huh? The return to the Cowboys. The day was a special one for many people. For the elderly, it was a chance to relieve or relive the joys of the times from before the war. For the youngest, it was a chance to finally see something on the telly that wasn't put there by the government. Oh, government propaganda. On a day the rest of the world marked as a, being honestly quite normal, the people of England watched as the American TV industry returned to England. Very cool. The EBC broadcasted a variety of newer Western films with cowboys and Indians dancing across the screens to, to the delighted eyes of tens of thousands of small children. Novelties like talk shows and quizzes enthralled their viewers for hours on end, and when the broadcast returned to more regular content outside the specific channels, there were more than a few people who thought it was all a bit of a shame, really. We have more questions or more options to watch at a night now. It's part of something bigger. No more can England be considered a glorified Rex Commissariat. No more do people talk 
to Germania when they want to talk to England or London. And no more are we considered a non-factor in world politics. Things have changed and changed tremendously. We have made our return to the world stage. The spotlight is on us, and the audience awaits our next lines. Now we strike the music and per begin to perform. It will increase by a massive amount, and our GDP will increase in growth. Which is very, very good. Mission triumphant. Prime Minister, we have an agreement. The Americans are going to build our stuff for us. They've already had some documents on the way, and we're beginning to look at contractors to do it. There's also some things the Americans for sure haven't come up with yet, and they sure want to check those out. Suspendous. Tremendous. Bueno. And apparently we don't believe in democracy here for now. Maybe next time. The people are quite apathetic at our uh, proposals. Nice. Keep building, building, building. And actually, that's for here. 75. Oh, oh, industrial giants. And now we got another civvy, it looks like. Flamethrowers are very nice. Those are very hot. Usually. If a flamethrower isn't hot, is it really a flamethrower? But are independence secure? The days of empire are long past. And yet English ambassadors find that their calls to Washington and Germany are answered increasingly frequently. Our country's strategic position off the off of Europe's shore, while putting at risk from the Reich on the continent and the Americans in Iceland, also presents us with a diplomatic opportunity. The Americans and the Germans want the honor of dancing with England alone. By dancing with both of them, we will remind them that England is a nation that deserves respect. A barbaric epilogue. Timothy Johnson was an eight-year-old boy. <clears throat> His papa was a teacher and his mommy stayed at home. Every day after school, he would go out to the yard and play with his friends. George and Michael out in the little cul-de-sac where he lived. Down at the end of the cul-de-sac was a little bungalow, the garden overgrown and the outside unpainted. Timmy didn't know much about who lived in the house. He knew it was a lady and George said he saw her once, old and wizened. Michael thought she took children into her house and ate them. He didn't really believe any of that, but Timmy was scared anyway. And Timmy was here. George dared him and he wasn't a wimp, so he took him up in stride. He glanced to his left and saw them ducking unsteadily behind some business or bushes. Timmy took a deep breath and knocked on the door. The cre door creaked open to reveal a woman with deep brown hair tied up in a bun. Oh, hello there, she said, smiling gracefully. Timmy looked down at the ground. Please don't eat me, miss. The, <laughs> the woman appeared confused for a moment before laughing. Oh, no, 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 no. I won't eat you. You're, there's no need to be afraid. Would you like a glass of milk? Timmy looked around before nodding. Thank you, Miss Timmy. Uh, thank you, miss. Timmy said shyly as he was handed the, the milk. The woman had a big smile on her face as she spoke again, her distinct accent ringing out. So, you are Timmy Johnson. Timmy recalled back in shock. The woman did a little laugh. Nothing to be worried about, dear. I speak to your mom all the time. She has plenty of stories about you. Timmy and the woman talked for a while, not for very long, though. Timmy found her very interesting. She told him about England, where she had come from, and which apparently was and st was still a very sad place. As she took the empty glass, he noticed he had, she had a distinct limp. Hey, miss, why do you walk all funny? She... <coughs> excuse me. Excuse me. She turned around and looked at the boy, and the light in her eyes seemed to drop a bit. That's a story for another time. Why don't you go back to your friends? They must be thinking that I've taken you away. Timmy got up and rushed away. And don't forget, you'll come back whenever you want. Innocence is a beautiful thing. Too bad it gets ruined for everybody. And after that, let's attack the libs. Sway the easily persuaded. Not all the liberal members of the United England were involved in the stupidity of modeling, as much as we might not like to admit it. Oh, Harrington's inaugurated, wow. After all, they're just as opposed to fascism as we were, and the party chairman can respect that quite a bit in the current era. We can impress upon them, the wise remembers that we really don't have any problems with their economic or social views, just their mistaken political allegiance. We can probably pull uh, over a dozen or so by doing this, and if we offer the right incentives to a few more, United England might start resembling the name it took. Even if we don't succeed in grabbing that many, one or two would be enough to make the point to MP modeling. He isn't as secure as he might think. Oh, look at that, nice. Let's stick with us now with the whales. We get more stability, which is... Already very good. Awesome. And liberalize the economy some more. Very good. We love liberalizing the economy. And we're almost out of places to build factories. That sucks. They know it's bad when the United Kingdom begins running out of places to build factories, but whatever. And then, Dirty Dirty Chesterton. Oh, Chesterton, you dude. The National Front is the single most despicable collection of traitors assembled on this, this side of Himmler. And at least Himmler only intended on making us vassals to the Americans. The National Front and the, their collection of fascist brain-dead imbeciles would have fa happily sold us out to the Germans if they won the election. Unfortunately, they still have a base, base of public support to draw off of. For England's sake, this bastion of evil will need to be stomped out, and fast. We can have some private investigators and the intelligence services dig for the more shockingly shocking crimes of the National Front. For the time being, as long as we get the dirt we need. It won't matter how long it'll take for us to get it. When we have it, we can finally give that scum Chesterton the send off to heck he he deserves. Nice. Nice. Look at that GDP. Three three percent. Not bad. Liberals know their place. Yeah, let's do the Chesterton first. That'll be nice. And removing the old guard, we could do that. I just want to keep boosting ourselves up. I just want to make England or like England. The United Kingdom as strong as humanly possible. 
We want a strong UK. Very incredibly strong. But the Liberals are another place. Let it not be said that Macmillan is lacking in mercy. We will not destroy the Libs in UE, but much rather we will merely cow them. They are too useful after all, and what will end, however, is their nominal independence. The Liberals had their chance to work mostly on their own, and they blew it. When they act, speak, and campaign, now will be with men and women loyal to Macmillan looking over their shoulders. Of course, we cannot guarantee everyone will get the message. The Prime Minister will likely engage in some symbolic resistance, but it won't matter. Macmillan runs the country now, and what he decides will be is what will be. And democracy dictation will basically be non-existent in England. A necessity done in shadow. In the back row, or back room of a downtrodden hotel, two dozen men sat in secret with Chairman Macmillan last night, who himself had entered the occasion under a heavy coat and hat that would conceal his features from afar. Mm, good. What was discussed was hardly legal, but it was also highly necessary. Chesterton and the National Front, having positioned themselves as a legitimate political party, wrapped in the flag and shrouded in patriotism, could not be so easily rounded up and imprisoned as the old Union of Facts had been in the 40s. Each of the assembled men had been given the same task, which was in every war, in every way, a matter of national security. They are professionals. Private investigators, ex-Special Forces operatives, and retired police detectives, it was a simple job of unfathomable importance. Find dirt on Arthur Chesterton. Parliament need, never needs to know, which is kind of weird since we already passed the anti-corruption bill, but hey, whatever! Ban the black shirts! Someone somewhere once said that revenge was a dish best served cold, and now that we are finally ex experiencing the feeling, we can say without a doubt that the person was most surely right. The National Front, a successor to the element of the far-right conservatives, and the British Union of Fascists was always far too keen about collaborating with the Germans. There were always mountains of evidence, but the Royal Party never seemed to feel it was in the right time to act. That's changed now. United England is not the royal party. We're the men of action, not caricatures of corruption and nepotism. Hence, fascism is always now the ideological equivalent of persona non grata in England. We'll ban their organizations, their parties, imprison their dumb fools enough to claim the label openly, and all the while they'll not be able capable of lifting a finger against us. Very good. Spending cut. 70 billion in GDP. Very, very good. And what can we do here? We can protect the English system. We are the industrial giants. That's still good to do. A scourge of fascism. Actually, let's do the clean royal party. The royal party, once, they were a more noble band of corrupt kleptocratic oligarchs, but now those days are long behind us. It's a shame, really. They deserve the purpose of keeping England out of the German grasp admirably for the years prior to the German Civil War, but they just weren't willing to go that extra step. Still, you can, you can make do with what you have, and we really don't have a use for them at the present time. Nepotism, beyond belief. Corruption, multiple unconfirmed but probably politically motivated killings. The list goes on and on. How long should England have to live with these disgraced disgraceful politicians. Why should they have to live with them existing in a state of luxury whilst the common man works hard for his bread? The answer is, they shouldn't. Defending the fascists, though. <clears throat> in a move that proved a shock to the nation, Harold Macmillan announced to Parliament today that the black shirts were now classified as a terror organization. We never tolerated armed extremists on our soil before, the Prime Minister said to the Assembly. It's only due to negligence that this group of thugs who fundamentally stand against all that a proud nation represents has been allowed to spread intimidation and violence across England. The statement was followed by an uproar from the members of the National Front, who were in attendance, causing such a stir that many had to be removed. Conveniently, several of those politicians who were removed were in fact members of the Black Shirts, and were taken directly from Parliament and, and into their holding cells to await trial. This move had already done a great deal to neuter the National Front and their pillar military man military arm, but Chesterton and most of his followers have yet to be dealt with, and have publicly denounced the move as a baseless power grab. Without their pet or terrorist organization, all they can do is complain. <clears throat> the scourge of fascism. Well, for all that the lofty proclamations of the illegality of the fascism get the public's attention, something sometimes it's better to avoid the potential conflicts down the road and address matters in the correct way, even if it's after the fact. The banning of fascism from politics act does, more or less, exactly what the title of the act states. Oh, it's all hidden behind fancy words. <clears throat> in the text of the act, but it doesn't take a genius to divine our feelings about fascism. Uh, the fascists are a band of traitors, criminals, and downright scum. United England hates them, England itself hates them, and heck, even the corrupt dudes in the royal party hates them. We're going to exercise this counter from England by any means necessary, and to do that we'll need to ban them outright. Who cares about what the Germans, a batch of good-for-nothing fascists, think? Very good. And we're getting closer and closer to 1970, which is very nice. How is production going? We're looking actually very good on everything. Very, very good. Actually, we might consider actually lowering our spending for military spending then. Because we're looking quite good on everything. Look at that. Nice. Uh, we could probably go ahead and try that. Eh, it doesn't help us out that much, but I really want to rush down slashing the budget. So, the scourge of fascism. An unwelcome memory. All the king's horses and all the king's men bringing the nation together again. 
vote royal party. Harold Macmillan stared blankly at the old poster. He thought he'd disposed of them all, but one last rem remnant of his time in the royal party had been lying in wait beneath an overdue stack of paper. Ah, bringing the nation together again, utterly tone deaf. Macmillan knew that they were the reason the country had divided itself in the first place. All that corruption in the party, all that inept greed and nepotism that led to a party that only cared for increasing their own influence and power at the expense of the nation. The hypocrites who gleefully purged labor but didn't lift a finger to thwart the tide of fascism that grew within the heart of the nation. Chesterton was their fault, the Civil War was their fault. Macmillan's blood boiled at the memory of how he'd stood by and let those incompetents run the nation into the ground. He tore the paper, uh, tore the poster into two, with the primal rage that most would have thought of him incapable. I'll die before I let those sniveling aristocrats destroy my country again by taking out our, our trash. Obvious corruption comes with a single rather large advantage over traditional secretive co corruption, which is that it's completely ob ob obvious to even the most cursory financial examination. How unfortunate for the royal party and peas, then, that they've grown used to open corruption over the course of some 20 years of unfettered power. We shall launch a series of corruption investigations against the more prominent members of the royal party to begin with. But as things roll on, we can go over every single royal MP's record to see to seek more hidden grifting as well. Party Chairman Macmillan will be very happy to see this go ahead smoothly, which is very, very good. And we do need to take out our trash. National Front support will decrease, which would be good. And we get a long overdue policy change. Silhouette deduction. Very nice. Why not? Why not? We love radar here. Maybe a bit too much. A long overdue policy change. And what's being seen as following up with the purge of the black shirts, Harold Macmillan told the nation this afternoon in a declaration before Parliament that spreading openly fascist viewpoints would be now considered an act of sedition, effectively declaring fascism to be treason. Oh boy. The outrage from the extremist nationalist segment of the population has been less than expected, with most preferring to return to their lives in peace rather than be imprisoned for their beliefs. Those who have been most vocal in protesting this change are already facing a rude awakening that the police are already unwilling to imprison them, them en masse. The declaration would likely spell the end for the NF, who have always been bordered on being more or less explicit in their fascism. Even so, Chesterton and his advisors are reconsidering their rhetoric, hoping that they might hide their views behind a layer of deniability, yet so ultimately reach the ears of the now closeted fascists who will understand the true meaning of what's being said. What, like some form of ultrasonic whistle? You never know. Dig out the rotten core. Unfortunately, we can't just imprison all the corrupt royal MPs. Aside from the negative press, most of them are legitimately guilty of little more than corruption, with only a handful activity collaborating with the Reich, and fewer still to any approvable extent at that. What we can do, however, is remove these corrupt MPs from Parliament in a more conventional manner. Once removed from office, new elections for the seats can be held. We might win some of them, but it's no great loss if we don't. We still have a majority. Macmillan's visionary leadership is starting to pan out, which makes one wonder what to do with modeling. Well, we've already tried to sideline him in the Liberals, but we'll see what happens. It goes, Lamont Wimberley pushes his memories. Field Marshal Douglas Wimberley is a controversial figure on the British Isle. Many of Scotland believe he was instrumental in keeping Scotland secure from German occupation. Others see him as a traitor and paranoia madman. This has led Wimberley himself to appear in the public eye to release a new autobiography that he hopes will cause the misconceptions of his time as Chief of Staff of the Scottish military to be cleared up. Scottish soldier, Wimberley's book is a culmination of work that the field marshal stood some time, or started some time before his retirement and the reunification. It's a complete recounting of his military service, with special emphasis given to his time in the First and Second World Wars and the formation of the Scottish Republic. Wimberley argues that the Republic was a necessary action to defend Scotland, and was not, merely a case of opportunism. He also defends some of the more controversial actions the Scottish armed forces took under his tenure, declaring those actions kept Scotland free and made the liberation and of an eventual unification of England possible. Despite massive sales in the North and Midlands, the book has come in for a fair share of controversy. Some unionists and leftists accuse Wimberley of being a malignant, a malignant spirit in Scotland and one that potentially jeopardized both Scottish freedom and union with England. Others have claimed the book is evidence that Wimberley was merely being misunderstood this entire time, pointing to support of Himmler and loyal service in the war as proof. Wimberley himself has not commented on the matter. He has, however, donated a collection of personal papers to the National Records of Scotland, hoping they and the book will be of aid to future researchers of the Scottish Republic. Everyone's a hero of their own story. Pretty much. Uh, we want to liberalize next. Uh, we have industrial. That's fine. Let's do that one first. The end of institutional. Uh the end of institution of corruption. A surge of panic has overwhelmed the political class of London today as UE Chairman Harold Macmillan announced today that there will be a drastic crackdown on political corruption. A widespread fear is formed as members of Parliament scramble to hide anything that might be incriminating. Although it's difficult to denounce any effort to make politics more honest, critics are reluctantly pointing out that this move is tantamount to an indirect purge of the Royal Party and is likely to get the opposition's ability to oppose Macmillan's government in any, way, any meaningful way. When asked by reporters if he felt that this was an undemocratic way of fighting the Royal Party, Macmillan made the following statement. We're only trying to remove the corrupting influences in English democracy. If the Royal Party has harbored so much of this dishonesty, then I have no pity for them. 
and the common people of England will find themselves better represented by the more honest leaders who will fill this void. The Royal Party is being targeted because they are corrupt, not because they are the opposition, but they deal with modeling. Original modeling was useful for a time. He had maintained the faith but with Ch party chairman Macmillan. He might have even been permitted to retain the seat of prime minister. Unfortunately, he was too greedy and, well, we don't need him anymore. We can't kick him out of the party, nor his liberals, but we can reduce him to a subordinate role they always should have occupied. Say goodbye to MP modeling and hello to the prime minister Harold Macmillan. Oh, and Reggie is now the vice prime minister for the sake of his ego. Macmillan isn't cruel. He's just doing what he needs to do. That should always be remembered so that we don't turn into the monsters that the royal party became which is probably a really good thing to do in the iberian wars and iberia has collapsed what's not to love and we still have 140,000 men here and i guess manpower ready to fight and die for the uk very good there you go and there you go nice and the prime minister power act with Harold Macmillan now officially in charge, it is time to remove all, some of the restrictions that we used to keep modeling in line for a start. The cabinet will be taking something of a back seat from now on. With the Prime Minister's off office acquiring a great deal of executive power so as to allow Macmillan to fully exercise his vision of a free and fair England. There are those who condemn this as some sort of power grab, but those merely lack the understanding of just how important Macmillan is to the continued functioning of England. It was he who guided us up until this point. For his deeds, he has more than earned the right to exercise a significant say in political matters. Out of respect for his vision, we will not stop him. Macmillan will save English democracy, and the people will cheer him on. Very nice. And uh, reduce unemployment first. 52 billion, not bad. And we have a mere two days left with this, which is good. I wonder if there's more after this one. The protection of something beautiful? I mean, he was modeling. Despite the recent clashing between the two, Harold Macmillan and Reginald Maudling were seen meeting today behind closed doors. No reporters even found a hint of what went on, but things were very different between the pair when they emerged several hours later. With the chairman uttering looking pleased with himself while Maudling looked utterly defeated. By the day's end, Maudling was seen reluctantly whipping up support for a new bill that would, reportedly, grant a greater deal of executive power to the chairman's office. Some speculation has surfaced that supposes Macmillan might have intimidated his former protege outright. Though most observers su suspected that threats would only have needed to be implied, considering the Macmillan's methods of dealing with political rivals thus far. Whatever is the case, this upcoming bill is likely to be passed and should be announced to the public in the coming weeks. I love democracy. Oh, we have the people have a brax. Oh, yeah, there's even more. Well, look at that. I did not realize that. Why? We finished our plans for the first four years? Okay. The protection is something beautiful. We sit at the crossroads of history. For from this precipice, we gaze upon there will be no return for a second chance for the mighty nation of England. It took us years to get to, even to this point. Years of struggle and bargaining and sacrifice, all for the ideal of a nation where choice was not dictated by some master in Washington or Germania, but from London. And just Harold Macmillan, who got us here. He who recognized when it was necessary to stand down and preserve what could be saved. He kept the Germans out of England. Through guile and deal-making, he preserved our institutions from within the royal party. Now as prime minister, he will sure ensure that both democracy and England are protected from the zeal of a man in his prime. Until the last, we do this for England. Sure, the prime minister act, which we don't even vote on, so. The prime minister has been pushed through the parliament today, or the act has been pushed through the parliament today, and the answer to the anxious anxiety and restless facing London in the, fake, in the face or the wake of the rumors of surrounding the bill. The act has been approved exactly to be what the opposition feared it would be, a move to sideline Parliament in favor of granting wide-sweeping executive powers to the office of Macmillan subordinate Prime Minister Reginald Maudling, or Reginald. Dismissing the criticism, Macmillan clarified that it was merely an update to the office, bringing it closer towards operating in a similar manner to the American presidency. Although most who have read the bill can clearly see that the newfound executive power extends far past the privileges enjoyed by a president, Macmillan and his party easily had a tight enough grip on the party or the government to force the act through. Parliament is, of course, outraged, but they no longer have much of a way, if any, to check Macmillan's power. I am the parliament. Uh, let's go and... Oh, I want to liberalize the economy a little bit more first. Oh, we have some research to do as well. Nice. Good. And if this is the end of this part, then I guess we'll go down here to the people have her back. United England has never been the most stable of parties. Granted, we have all had the common goal of opposing the corruption and ineptitude of the royal party, but the relations between our factions are nonetheless somewhat strained. Despite this, we have evidently been successful at our goals. For in spite of what our good friends in the opposition have alleged to us doing, and despite their our own problems as a party, we have just been re-elected to government. The people have chosen what is right over promises our opponents cannot keep, and so now it falls to us to come to on our own promises. The necessary work of turning England into a nation we can be proud of, and ensuring nobody interrupts that work before it is done. A toast to achievement. 
Original Malding sat before Chairman uh, Macmillan's desk, a restless leg tapping the floor time and time again. How had it gone this way? Almost four years of democratic backsliding. The opposition, purged under accusations of corruption, the British left, killed in a bloody civil war, the far right denounced and arrested as terrorists. It was an exclusive minority of opinions that Chairman Macmillan allowed to participate in politics, opinions that largely fell within the UE party. Worse, Macmillan, the power mad lunatic, had essentially turned the parliament into a spectating seats of governance. Could English democracy even survive this debacle? Was it already dead? Reggie asked the chairman, sliding a glass of whiskey across the desk and taking a seat from across from Maudling. <clears throat> you seem completely lost, Reggie. I will repeat myself. I said, I'm proud of how well we did in a single term. The great evils of our nation, the fascist national party, the blundering royal party, defeated utterly. Reginald felt his eyes bulge in incredulity, the veins in his neck popping out in furious rage. How could he be so proud of himself, so nonchalant about what he and his cronies had done? Who He who had eroded the Republic? He wanted to shout, wanted to scream against the darkness, but instead said nothing. Cheers, Reggie. Imagine what we'll accomplish for the next four more years, and we'll finish off with one more focus. Um, actually, we'll do this one, and we'll read one more. Fascism failed again. The Professional England. Harold Macmillan is a man of focus, commitment, and sheer will, something the royal party and their lackeys know very little about. When the rest of the English political class gave up upon the principles which once later a nation held together, he alone kept them breathing through the deals and deceit, whatever was necessary to survive. Now England is faced with a past of missed opportunity and a future of fraught with peril, and it's up to new United England to guide us through the maze. Under UE leadership, England will move forwards, unemployment will be lowered, and the economy made strong once more. From London to Carlisle, uh, Carcel, Carlos. England will be known, or shall know, neither poverty nor decay, for what is use is responsibility if it is not exercised. Good. There you go. Uh, anything for the debt? Yes, actually, yes. You can get that too. Two billion is not bad. And then we'll do that one, and then fashion fa failed again. Fascism is a blight upon all that is good and just in this world, a cancer upon nations and states across the globe that ought to be burned in the heck fire that spawned from. Yet in England, we have prevented its rise, and we have prevented the insidious uh, infection from seizing power and influence for its masters in Germania. All thanks to the work of Prime Minister Harold Macmillan. Macmillan, who recognized the mistakes of the royal party in allowing the fascist hardliners into their ranks, who has always and will continue to oppose it wherever it rears its ugly head in England. England stands united by its traditions, its spirits, and its prime minister of fascism, and all who act as its agents are not welcome here. And I want to read about that event first from the focus before we end the episode. The cycle begins anew. Cool. Nothing there? That's fine. A cycle begins anew. Freshly re-elected Chairman Harold Macmillan publicly thanked the nation today for the faith in his administration. After four years of hard, fighting hard against the forces of fascism and corruption in the nation, Super Mac has been lauded for his wild success in ousting German influence and his moves to unify and stabilize the nation in the wake of the Civil War. Though much criticism has been leveled his way at the supposed cheapening of English democracy during his term, no one can know for sure if that trend will continue on to the second term as Macmillan continues his crusade against those he believes to be a threat to national stability. Who shall be... Who, what shall the future hold for England? You made the right choice. England then Super Mac will lead the way, and will keep England and Scotland and Wales and Cornwall all going the same direction, kicking and screaming. But if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we continue to make the United Kingdom, United Kingdom, the greatest place in Europe. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.